My name is Susie York and welcome to this recording of the Legal Aid for Wards in Discharge Applications presented by Eleanor Lean in the Legal Aid Board and now I'll pass you over to Eleanor. Thanks Susie. Um, hi everyone, um, as Susie said, my name is Eleanor Lean. I'm a solicitor in the head office of the Legal Aid Board. Um, what I would like to do is to give you all some information about applying for legal aid in respect of the discharge from wardship applications and just to talk a little bit about how legal aid works in these particular cases. So just to say at the outset that there are special provisions for legal aid for a ward in the discharge from wardship applications uh, under the new Assisted Decision Making Capacity Act. These relate to financial eligibility thresholds for legal aid and also relate to the payment of contributions towards legal aid. And I'm going to go through those fully in a few minutes. I suppose, importantly, what I want to state at the outset is that committees can apply to the Legal Aid Board for legal aid in these discharge from wardship cases. And where the committee is applying on behalf of the ward and in the name of the ward, the committee will get the benefit of these new special provisions that apply to wards that I'm going to talk about in a minute. Um, I understand that most of you watching are committees, so just to please bear that in mind as I go through the slides today. The committee can apply on behalf of the ward and those special legal aid provisions will apply to the committee. So first things first, how does the ward or the committee on behalf of the ward apply for legal aid? So there are two main ways of applying as set out in this slide here. One on an application form or two by applying online on our website. So looking first at the application form, an application form can be obtained by calling into or by phoning any of our law centres around the country and one can be sent out to you. There is a link there that you can click on uh, to find out where our law centres are located and to get the contact details for the law centres. You can also download and print the application form directly from our website. So I've put the link up there, www.legalaidboard.ie, and the application form is on the home page at the bottom centre of the page. You can also contact head office on 066 947 1000 our email head office on info at legalaidboard.ie and request an application form and it will be sent out to you. The other option then is to apply online. Again, that's on www.legalaidboard.ie. Uh, the link um, to the homepage is on there. And again, it's at the center bottom of the page and you will in input the wards details when you apply online there. So what information goes on the application form? So firstly, the personal details of the ward. So the name, date of birth, address, PPS number, if you have it, of the ward. Where the committee is applying on behalf of the ward, we would also like you to put down the committee details. So again, the name, address and contact details of the committee so that we can contact the committee about the ward's application. You have to give a brief outline about why you are applying for legal aid. So you would set out that it's for a discharge application, so a discharge from wardship matter. You put some details about the wardship. So when was the ward made a ward of court? What were the circumstances that required them to be taken into wardship? You give a brief outline about the ward's current situation, including the details of any other person or organisation involved with the ward. And you should also provide the name of the case officer dealing with the ward's case in the wards of court office so that we have a contact there. Then there is a section on the financial information of the applicant, so the income and assets of the ward, okay? So to be very clear, this is the details about the income assets of the ward, and we do not require the financial information of the committee where the committee are applying on behalf of the ward. We will not be looking for those where the application is in the name of the ward and on behalf of the ward. So as the committee, you will have some knowledge of the ward's finances and assets. Um, so you give whatever information you do have. You might not have the exact figures and values. Um, so that's fine. Don't worry about that. The law centre will ultimately be able to get those um, details from the wards of court office when we get the um, schedule of assets uh, when the discharge process begins. OK, so that is not something to overly worry about. The next slide deals with the supporting documentation required with the application. So we do look for proof of income of the ward, so a social welfare receipt or evidence of any other income of the ward. Again, I just want to be clear that if you don't um, have these, you're not to worry about it. We will be able to get this verification from the wards of court office anyway, again, when the application for discharge is commenced. We also look for proof of identification of the ward. 
So ordinarily, this would take the form of a photographic ID, such as a passport or driver's license. What we have been finding in these particular cases is that many wards do not have a photo ID because they've never had a requirement for it. So again, this is not something for you to worry about. Um, where there's no photo ID, uh, we may need some other proof of identification, um, such as um, we might go through the wards of court office or by liaising with the accommodation or setting that the ward is in to make some inquiries in relation to identification. We'll advise you about what is required, and, but the main thing is that you don't need to worry about it if you don't have a photographic ID for the ward. The last thing that we do require is a copy of the declaration order that was made when the ward was taken into wardship. And if you have any other orders that have been made since then, you can provide a copy of those also. If you don't have the declaration order, you can contact the case officer involved in the ward's case and they will send one out to you. And I'd suggest doing this um, uh, now, I suppose, so that you have it available to you when you make the application for legal aid. So the Legal Aid Board have assigned a number of law centres around the country to deal with cases under the Assisted Decision Making Act and to deal with the discharge applications. And these law centres that are set out here in the bold writing are the main law centres that deal with these cases. But other law centres besides these around the country may also deal with the cases, but these are the main ones. So if you are Dublin based, you would be applying to Finglas Law Centre. And just a note in relation to that is that Finglas Law Centre will be moving to Bally One very shortly. So if you haven't already commenced an application with Finglas, just to note that it'll be Bally One that you will be applying to, or if you've chosen to wait until uh, later on in the, the three year process to apply for legal aid, um, it will be um, to Bally One if you're based in Dublin that you'll be applying to. If you're based in Cork, you'll be applying to Cork South Law Centre. If you're based in Meath or Louth, you'll be applying to Dundalk Law Centre. If you're based in Kildare or Wicklow, you'll be applying to Wicklow Law Centre. If you're based in Donegal, Cavan, Leitrim or Monaghan, you'll be applying to Letterkenny. If you're based in Waterford, Tipperary, Kilkenny, Wexford or Carlow, you can apply to Waterford Law Centre. If it's Limerick or Kerry, you'll apply to Limerick Law Centre. If you're based in Clare, you'll apply to Ennis. If you're based in Mayo or Galway, you'll apply to Castlebar. Then just in relation to the final one there, Port Leash will be dealing with uh, cases for the counties set out there. So Sligo, Longford, Roscommon, Offaly, Leash and Westmeath. They're not yet accepting applications um, under this Act, but they will be shortly. So in the meantime, you can apply to any other law centre of your choosing. Uh, and as I said, the details I've set out there in the previous slide are set out on our website for all the law centres. So who will be dealing with the case? So first of all, a clerical officer or legal clerk uh, in the law centre will process the application form. Once the application form has been processed and put up on our system, the application will then go on our waiting list. A solicitor from the law centre will then be assigned to deal with the discharge application. A solicitor from a panel of private solicitors who are paid by the Legal Aid Board may also be assigned to deal with the case where the law centre, for whatever reason, cannot deal with the case themselves. So uh, before I go through the special provisions I spoke about a minute ago on legal aid that apply to the ward, I want to briefly explain what the normal rules for financial eligibility for legal services are. So normally anybody applying for legal services must satisfy a financial eligibility test. So a financial assessment is carried out on the applicant where we look at the person's annual disposable income and we look at their disposable capital. The person applying must have annual disposable income of less than €18,000 and disposable capital of less than €100,000. Normally also, the person applying must pay a financial contribution towards the legal services, which is assessed based on the person's income and capital resources. So the usual rules, however, do not apply to the ward or to the committee applying on behalf of the ward and in the name of the ward in a discharge from wardship application. So the ward's income does not have to be less than the, eight, the threshold of 18,000 euros that I mentioned, or their assets do not have to be less than the 100,000 threshold that I meant. So when I talk about assets, I talk about uh, their funds in court, any bank accounts that they hold, or any property besides a family home that they own. So the key thing to take away is that legal aid will be granted to the ward or the committee on behalf of the ward, no matter how much money is held on account for the ward or no matter what the value of their assets might be. All wards 
are entitled to legal aid in these cases no matter what, and that applies to committees applying on behalf of the ward. The other big difference here is that no contribution has to be paid by the ward in advance of receiving legal aid. And regardless of their income, monies on account or their other assets, we will never ask for a contribution in advance. So you might be wondering then, why do we need the financial information and why are we carrying out a financial assessment on the ward? The Legal Aid Board is still required to financially assess the ward to see if they would have been under or over the thresholds that are normally in place. And the reason for this is that the new law provides that a ward who would not have been financially eligible or who would not have been under the normal thresholds might be subject to a clawback of costs at the end of the proceedings. So what does that actually mean? So a ward whose annual disposable income is under the 18,000 euros and whose disposable capital is less than the 100,000 euros will never have any liability for any costs. They will never be asked to pay any costs of the proceedings. Then a ward whose annual disposable income is over the 18,000 euros or whose disposable capital is over 100,000 euros might be subject to recovery of some or all of the costs of the legal aid board of the discharge application at the end of the proceedings. So you might be wondering then what are the potential costs? So to be clear, information about costs will be provided to you by the solicitor at the start of every case where the ward's income or assets um, is or is likely to be over the normal threshold. This would include information on how the costs will be calculated at the end and the likely types of costs that might form part of a bill of costs. The solicitor will also update you as the case goes on if any additional cost arises for whatever reason. So an example might be where a um, some additional report is required above that of the court's medical visitor. So if an additional functional capacity assessment is required or for nursing report is required um, and if, if that is not payable from the ward's account, then we will uh, pay for that and that will form part of the bill of costs. So what are the maximum costs of the legal aid board? So the legal fees payable by the ward to the legal aid board are capped. OK, so this means that the fees for the solicitor hours or uh, a brief fee for a barrister will never exceed what we would have paid to a private solicitor on our panel who would deal with one of these applications. So those legal costs that we pay a private practitioner range from €3,950 for an uncontested case to €5,835 for a contested case. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. Just to note that VAT is payable on these costs at 23%. Then added to the bill of costs will be any other um, additional costs that arise, such as outlay um, or the cost of taking up any orders that are needed if they weren't available. Um, as I mentioned, any reports um, that are necessary for the case, uh, stamp duty, witnessing fees or, or any other swearing fees, they will be added to the bill of costs. So just to mention in relation to the 3,950, um, that fee plus VAT and any other expenses will be where the matter is uncontested and the higher fee of 5,835 would be where the matter is contested. Um, when I say contested, what I mean is where there might be some objection from some party or there might be a disagreement about who might be appointed as a decision making representative or a co-decision maker for the ward or where the ward might have their own views in relation to how the matter is dealt with uh, and somebody else has a different view. So what I would say about that, my view is that most of these cases will be uncontested um, and I think that has been the experience so far and the, the reality is that the most um, that is likely to be payable where those cases are uncontested is 3,950 plus VAT plus the expenses. So, sorry, just to be clear that um, those costs are not payable by the committee. It will be from the ward's assets, the assets that those uh, costs would be taken if they are to be taken. So we'll never look for costs from the committee. So now all of that said, the Civil Legal Aid Act 1995 does provide for a mechanism whereby an application can be made to the Legal Aid Board to fully or partially waive any costs that might be might be due to the board. We are awaiting regulations from the government as to how the Legal Aid Board should operate um, the recovery of costs and the waiver of costs um, mechanism in relation to these particular cases. 
Um, and we are in discussions with the government about these and we will clarify with the wards of court office once we have any information on that. But I just want to give you an idea here of how the waiver of application waiver of waiver application for costs works generally uh, and just how I think it's going to apply to these types of cases. So at the end of the case, the solicitor will contact head office and they'll give an outline of what has been involved in the case. So the solicitor hours, whether a barrister is involved and any other costs that have been involved. Head office will prepare a bill of costs and we will send that to the solicitor who will present that either to the ward if they're discharged or to you if you're appointed either as a decision making assistant, a co-decision maker or a decision making representative or whoever is appointed as, as one of those roles. Um, and then an application can be made in writing to the head office by the solicitor to waive the costs that are due to the board um, by the ward. The solicitor will provide information in relation to the ward um, or in relation to the person discharged and what use their income or assets or other funds are to be put to. Uh, what we look at is whether hardship will be caused to the person if we were to proceed to seek our costs from them. And cost then can be waived either fully or partially on the basis of hardship. So that's how it currently works. So then on that basis, um, I've set out there an example um, of a reason why costs in these cases might be waived. So where the assets of the person discharged include monies such as a personal injury settlement, uh, and those monies are for the medical care or accommodation into the future, then hardship can be made out because if the board was to take its costs, monies that have been assessed for the care or the accommodation of the, the former ward would be taken from them. So that's a, an example of where I, I would see hardship arising. So the last two slides are where the committee might decide um, that they want their own independent legal advice about their own position or the role going forward and the obligations involved if you're appointed as a decision making representative or if you're appointed as a co-decision maker or so on under the new laws. You can make an application for legal services in your own name for legal advice if you want to have independent legal advice from the ward about those matters. You must be financially eligible and you will pay an advice contribution which will range between 30 euros and 150 euros if you want that independent legal advice. Another reason why you might need separate legal services is if during the application um, some sort of conflict arises, um, like I'd mentioned a minute ago, if the ward has a different view to you or if some other party, some other family member is involved, you might decide that you want your own separate legal representation or the court, for whatever reason, might direct that the ward and committee should have separate legal representation. In that instance, the committee then will have to seek legal services in their own name. OK, so they um, will apply for legal services um, they will be financially assessed and they must be financially eligible and they will pay the contribution that is assessed based on their income and capital. Um, I just to be clear, I think circumstances like that arising will be very rare, but I just want to give you that information so that you have it to the back of your mind um, when you're dealing with these applications. Um, I don't think any issues like that are arising um, to date, but it's just that that facility is there if you want your own independent legal advice or legal representation. Um, so then the final slide um, just sets out um, some resources. Um, just our website is www.legalaidboard.ie. As I mentioned, you'll find the um, application form for legal services there and the online application form. There's also a guide to completing the application for legal services. There's also a, a calculator there, a financial eligibility calculator. Uh, it's called Am I Eligible? And you can input your financial information there to see if you would be eligible in your own right for legal aid or if the ward's uh, resources would be over or under the thresholds. There's also a section uh, with information on assisted decision making and discharge from wardship. And then finally, if you have any queries, you can contact info at legalaidboard.ie or you can contact any of the law centres that I listed in one of those earlier slides there and they'll provide you with any information you require. Or again, you can contact us by telephone on 066 9471000 and we'll deal with any questions that you might have. Um, so that's it. Um, and I hope that has been of assistance to you all. Thanks, Eleanor. We now have um, some questions, so I'll hand you over to my colleagues. Thanks, Eleanor. Um, where the committee is making an application on behalf of the ward, can the notice of motion be grounded on an affidavit by the committee? 
Yes, it can be, uh, to the best of my knowledge. Um, uh, and I think that is the process that has been taking place to date with any applications that have been made to the Legal Aid Board, that they will um, they will swear, the, the committee will swear the affidavit or a member of the committee will swear the affidavit once um, the proceedings are ready to go. Thanks. Hi, Eleanor. Um, what happens if there's a long waiting list at a law centre? Uh, we will look at each case and um, a priority will be assigned to any case where there's an immediate issue such as accommodation issues or any other type of issue that might be involved. Um, the law centres, uh, the managing solicitors would review all applications received on a twice weekly basis to establish um, if anything needs priority and we move it up the list. I suppose the other thing is that if there are already proceedings in being where somebody else has issued the application and the ward needs their own independent representation or that their voice is required in the proceedings. If there's already a, a court date, then we will always give that priority. Thank you. Hi, Eleanor. Is there any assistance available to if somebody has difficulty um, completing the forms? Uh, yeah, we do have an access officer um, and I have raised a query with him whether there are um, special certain people to be assigned, I suppose, to deal with those particular cases. Um, he has not come back to me as of yet, but um, I expect that there will be um, a, a number of people assigned across the law centres with specific training um, to assist people um, to make the applications who might have difficulty, say, for example, filling out the form themselves. Um, or whatever assistance that might be required in terms of accessing the information in terms of where they'd apply, um, there will be assistance provided to um, towards it where that's necessary. Um, I just don't have the full details on that yet as to who those people will be. Thanks, Alan. Hi, Eleanor. Um, I have two related questions. Um, when will clawback of cost apply? Uh, so the clawback of costs won't be applied until the end of the proceedings. So um, we wouldn't know what the costs are until the conclusion of the proceedings. So as I said, we'd calculate, we'd receive from the solicitor involved with the case an outline of the cost. So what hours they have put into the case. Uh, the barrister brief fee, if anything additional was payable to a barrister for drafting anything unusual. Um, I don't expect that to arise very often um, and any other any other outlay that has been involved. So we would draft up the bill of costs at the very end of the case and then provide that to either the ward themselves if they've been fully discharged or to um, whichever of the decision support um, mechanisms that have been assigned to the case will provide it to the person who's been assigned. Um, and at that stage, we will we will liaise with whoever that is in relation to the bill of costs at that point. But just to be very clear, we don't have regulations yet, so we're still uncertain. But I mean, that's how I see it working in practice. Um, uh, until we have regulations, I can't give you a, a specific answer, you know, until until we get those. And just in terms of how the Department of Justice wants us to operate um, that clawback mechanism. And sorry, just to follow up on that one, then, who pays the cost if clawback does apply? The costs will. So as I mentioned, the costs will only be payable by the ward's assets. So assets, sorry, assets or funds in court. Now, it's really in terms of, I suppose, funds in court or any monies that are held on account. We will never look to the committee to pay anything. Um, it's only if there's assets above or assets or monies on account above that 100,000 threshold that we would be going back looking for costs to be payable. And again, that waiver mechanism is there and I would strongly um, suggest that that should be applied for in every case and we'll consider the facts of each case um, as they come into us. Perfect, lovely, thank you. Hi Eleanor, um, what is the maximum amount payable? So uh, I suppose really it would depend on whether the case is uncontested or contested, as I mentioned. So um, the um, minimum fee payable would be €3,950 Euros plus that, plus whatever additional cost arises as the case go al goes along. I don't anticipate that there'll be um, any major additional costs um, involved because the functional capacity report um, is prepared by the court's medical visitor. Um, unless the court wants specific information in relation to one of the types of decisions that the um, decision supporter might need to make, I don't anticipate that many reports or anything like that would be required. Um, so the minimum would be the 3,950 plus VAT. And then where the case is contested, and for whatever reason that might be where there's any um, objection or disagreement between parties involved, then you'd be looking to the higher um, bracket of the 5,800 plus VAT um, 
figure that I had outlined in that slide there. But it will never be more than that, um, I suppose, just to emphasise that, that they are the minimum and maximum cost that will apply. Um, so they, that's the height of it um, uh, in terms of our fees um, that would be payable to the legal aid board. And again, the waiver of cost mechanism will be there and we will apply that any at any time when the application is made to us, we'll apply whatever rules we are advised should apply to it by the department um, once we get those. But I expect it will be similar to the hardship um, criteria and what the wards uh, funds or assets are likely to be used for into the future. Okay. Thank you. Okay.